Today I am here with Angel Ellis and we are going to have her talk to you about her writing. Hello, how are you? I'm great, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. So what influenced you and started to get you into the writing game? You know, I think my whole life, and I do mean practically my whole life, uh, I have been a passionate reader, and I have also been a writer. Um, I think I have done, over the years, every kind of writing except translation from one language into another. And I still have an idea about that because I have <laughs> a friend who teaches French and is, you know, is obviously very fluent in French, and I would love to um, translate a book of poetry in French with her into English. And that isn't uncommon uh, for a poet to work with someone who is really fluent in a language. So if I, once I do that, I can say I, I, I've, I've done practically everything. <laughs> but I know you primarily you know, I grew up poetry. Yes, oh, sorry. yes I'm, <laughs> I'm primarily known as a poet, but uh, it's been an interesting road and I'll just try to, encapsulate. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things about me is that all four of my grandparents were immigrants and came to this country not knowing English. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother's parents as young teenagers, uh, my father's father as barely adult, we actually we think he lied about his age and he was really 16 and not 18. And then when he went back for a bride 10 years later or so, um, my, my grandmother was younger than he. So she was maybe 21, 22 when she came to this country. So they were young immigrants. But um, growing up with immigrant grandparents and my grandparents were all alive into my adulthood. And in the, the where they lived, they, um, they emigrated to the far Northwest corner of New York state, it's almost Canada. And there were paper mill villages there at the time, Nicole. There, there, uh, the mills, paper mills are gone now. They've mm -hmm. been gone for tw uh, over 20 years and more. But uh, that's where a lot of the people were, people from a lot of different countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my, uh, my mother's family, the men, uh, worked in the mill and, or the mills. They were not, there were several of them. And my uh, father's father had a store. He call, it was called Ellis's Cigar Store. Oh, how cool. I, I remember it. He kept it. I think I was maybe 11 years old or so when he actually retired. Uh, but, uh, you know, he'd been an older grandfather having, um, you know, married a little bit later in life. So for those days. So English, mastering English, growing up with people who really struggled to master English. And um, I have to say that I, I pride myself on the fact that I can understand almost anybody because there were some people in the villages uh, who never really learned English, you know, because they lived in, in these communities where people understood them. And in my mother's paper mill village, there, there was a, you know, they, they, well, the mill built houses while well, there were tenements at first <laughs> but there was an Italian block and there was a Polish block but of course not all the Eastern European people who came to work in the mills were Polish but you know people just kind of you know I mean so that was familiar to me as a matter of fact when um, my grandfather was uh, my father's father was at the end of his life he lived to be nearly 95 years old and he sort of lost his English as happens sometimes to people who are immigrants and you know they're failing you know mentally and they go back to their native language and I said this to a friend I said well you know how old people you lose their English and she just gave me this stare I mean she this was so totally out of her life experience <laughs> I mean and I'm thinking oh of course you know her family has been in this country for whatever seven eight nine ten generations mm -hmm. she 
has never been related to anyone or grown up in close proximity to anyone who lost their English or who never really gained it. And in the course of as some of the neighbors, I mean, my all my grandparents did become functionally fluent in, in English. They had to because of yeah. circumstances and they were a bit younger. But um, so that was a big, big influence on me because we were in no way encouraged to learn more than a smattering of my grandparents' languages. I mean, um, my, my mother's parents came from Chicano, Italy. It's between Rome and Naples. I know very little Italian, though I studied it in school. Uh, my father's parents were from uh, the mountains of Lebanon. Um, and uh, I know very little Arabic. I also don't know much French, although my grandmother, uh, who was the only four to really have a formal education, went to a, a school taught by French nuns and she was fluent in French. And I, I just feel in a sense, although that was the way it was at the time, you know, be American master, or in my case, overmaster the English language. My brother and I always tease that we were taught by my parents almost to speak like little professors because <laughs> they had suffered, I think, some embarrassments as the children of immigrants whose command of language was more limited. And my father's parents spoke with, you know, what we would consider quite distinctive accents <laughs> for all their lives. So, you know, we were to be the American kids who just bastard the hell out of English. <laughs> and I really think that that is a lot of my beginnings as a writer. Plus my mother, uh, who my mother is a, a sort of a frustrated actress and she was a champion reciter of poetry and other little set pieces when she was in uh, grammar school particularly. And she taught those pieces to me. And what were those pieces? They were English and American poets. Mm -hmm. Some of them you would know, some of them have I've sort of faded from history. <laughs> but so I, I, you know, I grew up hearing poetry. And I happened to have been one of those weirdly precocious kids. I was reading fluently by the time I was four years old. When I got into school, they discovered I was reading at a fourth grade level and up me to an accelerated class. And <laughs> by the time I was 10 or 11, I was reading adult books after having devoured all of the folk and fairy tales and children's <laughs> literature and children's biographies, you know, of adults. Uh, that I could that I could get, and then I started on my father's college Shakespeare. So you were destined to be a writer with all of this reading. Um, I think that I was, and I always wrote. I would um, write all. Sometimes I would get tired. I probably wrote a hundred beginnings of fairy tales, <laughs> but the first piece that I wrote that got an audience when I was ten, my father changed jobs and we moved and. I would always write uh, little poems in the cards that used to make, I don't know, do, you, do your sons still make you cards, Nicole, mm -hmm. you know, yes. they'll make cards. It, I guess it's one of the pleasures of parenthood. And so, of course, you know, we would make birthday cards and Mother's Day cards and Father's Day cards. And I would always write little poems in them. And to this day, I write people birthday poems at, on Facebook, as you might know. Yes. <laughs> But I wrote a poem called A Manager's Farewell for my father. And he read it at his going away party. And he said it got a huge round of applause and everyone loved it and laughed. And I think it was the first real affirmation I can recall getting as a writer. I was so excited <laughs> that this audience of grownups, adults, had really liked my little poem, which I know by heart, but I won't, I won't necessarily say it unless you want me to say it. <laughs> Uh, but but that was um, you know that was important to me and and of course as I said I my mother was a great reader mm -hmm. although you know my father went to college my mother didn't my mother was always a great reader there were always books in our house and even I even when we got to the point where I had to sneak her her books out of her dresser drawer because there was a time when literature shifted when I was about. At 12, 13 years old, and books started getting more risque for adults. Mm -hmm. And so she hid those books from me, and I had to kind of like sneak them out to read them, but <laughs> whether she knew that or not. Uh, and, and then the library, we were always at the library. The, I think the first ID card I ever carried was a library card, mm -hmm. you know, 
So we went to the local library regularly, as well as to the, you know, the school library. Mm -hmm. So libraries are always a big part of my li life and librarians. Librarians have, for the most part, been extraordinarily kind to me, both in my childhood and as an adult. I even, there used to even be there used to be a, this, these adult sections that children's, children were not supposed to go in, but <laughs> I was allowed to go in them sometimes because I was such a well-behaved, precocious child. Like sometimes I would get to sneak peek at adult books that way. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first publish and what steps did you take when you first decided to write your book? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit in time because I've had several phases of life as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in college, I was a writer and editor for the Pitt News. I started as a copy editor, which is incredible training in how to put stories together and edit them from the micro to the macro level. My Bibles were the New York Times Manual of Style and Usage and Strunk and White's uh, The Elements of Style. <laughs> and I learned a lot doing that. And then I became features editor. And then I was editor of uh, um, a little magazine supplement, monthly magazine supplement that we had in the Pit News for a few years. I think it was something like three years, four years. Um, and so I learned i mean i think studying journalism is really a great training for a writer because you learn how to write concisely you learn how you know the, the sort of the bones of stories and remember because i was writing features and reviews and i still write reviews you know it's funny how things come full circle <laughs> that uh i felt that that was tremendous training for me and then I also had a, a, a job in college where I worked um, for the computer center uh, doing a newsletter that they were that, that they put out. So I had so I was writing about some technical subjects, but in a more feature like way. And in college, there, were, there used to be there for a few years in Pittsburgh, the late Richard Mellonscape had a magazine called The Pittsburgher, which was his answer to Pittsburgh magazine. It didn't last all that long, but I was an intern on that magazine and I actually also got paid to write a couple of articles, you know, feature articles after I had finished my internship. So so that was, you know, that was great early training. But then I spent five years as a technical and business writer because I had to support myself and that's where the money was. Mm -hmm. And I was supporting that on my, not only myself, but my husband at the time who uh, was in law school. So, you know, girls got to make a living. Nicole. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but again, even in, um, you know, working with technical people, which is can sometimes be difficult, you know, you learn. I, I feel that everything that you write <laughs> goes into the hop. And of course, people would come around kind of sneakily and ask me to look over their resumes and their, uh, you know, their cover letters and things that, uh, you know, <laughs> just just fix it up a little for me. But, you know, I, I actually am as proud of my skills as an editor as I am as a writer. And I think that that's one thing that I would say to writers. I say you have to learn how to look at your work and other people's work at a distance so that because if you just write something and even if you put it away for a little while and bring it back and you can't see what's wrong with it you know you're kind of in trouble and that's why I encourage people to join writers groups to take classes uh even if they can't afford um a degree or a master's degree you know there are programs such as uh, Mad Women in the Attic, which is uh, run by Carlo, but it is not a degree program and the classes are actually reasonable. And you can learn a lot mm -hmm. from being in groups with other writers about learning to shape your work and uh, look at your work critically and even in, in taking some courses, uh, you know, really learn how, if you're serious, 
mm -hmm. how to make your writing better because it's not just writing as you know it's writing and rewriting and rewriting and editing and if you're and I, so i'm just gonna say this up front if you're not really willing to do that just be a passionate reader right because that process yes because even though hemingway said famously first thought best thought mm -hmm. that's true sometimes i mean sometimes we'll write something and we know it's good or you know we know we're inspired but a lot of times no, it needs work <laughs> and you go through a lot. And so you asked me about publishing. The first book I published came out of the work I did in the peace movement and for an organization called the Pittsburgh Peace Institute. I organized a number of classes, um, both for adult and adolescent learners, but I was focused on teenagers and I organized a fairly lengthy pilot at a local high school and then um, with, with someone else, with someone who was an experienced teacher, and then we made it into a book. But how did that get published? <laughs> well, this was back in the late 90s. So what I, you know, and we forget how, how technology marches on in some ways. I created, it was more than, uh, it, was, it was a really beefy book proposal. And I, I had my brother, who uh, is a graphic designer, design it for me because in those days we couldn't produce uh, and send documents, you know, electronically. Mm -hmm. And we could produce them, you know, through word processing and print them out and send them. But so, so I had I had him typeset it, and I put it into binders, and I sent it out to fifty educational publishers. Ten of those publishers got back to me. <laughs> I, I'm, but it's even worse today. I mean, I, I'm just telling you, this is the way it was. This is this this book came out in 1997. So ten of those publishers got back to me. Of those ten, three had positive reactions to the book, but only one offered me a publishing contract. <laughs> so that was one out of fifty. I mean, you really have to if you are submitting work, you really have to do the work. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it is daunting. I was just at uh, a poetry uh, launch through Zoom, of course, because we've been doing everything through Zoom for over a year now, as well you know. And uh, the poet said that she had entered 161 contests before she, over a course of 10 years, while she was developing this full length poetry manuscript before she won a contest. Now, she said that about 25 times she came close, but that's still, that, that, that's, that's almost, I don't know if I could, if I could do that now, because, because now I'm older. Now, now this writer is around 40 or so, but still, I was shocked at that because when my, my first book of, uh, so now, now we're going to go ahead some, some years, um, I did start sending work out to journals and then I was just on fire to write a book of poetry. And I was, did have a poet friend who was my sounding board and we went back and forth and he knew a local publisher. That's another way. Sometimes, you know, there are a lot of, for, for people viewing this anywhere, Pittsburgh or anywhere, there are small publishers, local publishers in every area of the country who are willing to look at manuscripts and publish them so you don't necessarily have to enter contests to get mm -hmm. published if you uh so my first book was published by um six gallery press a small press here in pittsburgh but they published a number of books however you know i also won a big award with some poems from that book um a fellowship from the pennsylvania council on the arts it's the biggest award I've ever won. It was $5,000, I'll tell you that. Although my first book was, I did get grant money for the first book because it was educational. So, but I'm putting that in a different category. But then I thought, well, gee, maybe I could have gone, gotten with a bigger publisher. But, you know, I was burning to get the book out in the world. And, mm -hmm. and it did kind of launch me because it got good reviews and things like that. And then I did uh, put together uh, my second book. 
I think I sent that book out 24 times before it was a runner up in a contest and I was offered a publishing contract. So I went with it. But I will tell you, you know, you never know what you're getting with a publisher. There are publishers who are very easy to work with, you know, and then there are publishers who are extremely difficult to work with. And I'm not going to name any names here, out any people, but these are publishers who have good reputations and who publish a lot of books. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes as a writer, you really have to take a lot of hard knocks, even after your book is accepted for publication. Mm -hmm. And it is important also to publish in journals. And, and yes, you know, sometimes you, you, you're happily accepted. Sometimes, you know, you get, you get rejections or you just get ignored. Mm -hmm. And another problem that I think contemporary writers face, Nicole, is the sort of the disappearance of their work. Because as more and more work goes online, and on one, one hand, that's wonderful. You can Google me and, you, and stuff pops up and you can go there. But when journals cease publication, sometimes they don't keep their archives live. Right. I, I, I do know some journals that have gone out of print that have thought it important to keep their work on the, uh, on the World Wide Web. But there are others, you know, you press the link and it's like error 404. It no longer exists. I hate that error and, 404. <laughs> and... That's the thing. A, a, a writer friend who's also a bookseller said to me, she said, you know, so I had so much stuff in little online journals that no longer exist and they didn't maintain a web archive. So it's, she said, it's like that work is poof, where if it had been in a book, someone could buy the book somewhere. Mm hmm you know, because there's a huge brisk trade in books and in used books, lots of booksellers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as well as new books. But, but, that, but that, I think that is, that is a difficulty of the electronic age. And I don't know how we're ever going to solve it because I, because I know people who, um, well, of course, if you do an ebook and you down, you know, you download the ebook uh, then you have it, but you know, then people have computer malfunctions, and then, you know, some again, there are whole presses that go out of even presses that publish uh, hardcover books go out of business. But if something exists in a hard copy, you can generally hunt it up. But sometimes there are things that were just online. That unless you got it, you know, that you would never know of if you were trying to, you know, research a writer. Mm -hmm. because uh, they're, they're just gone. So there's always that, that tension of wanting, you know, to get your work into book form just to preserve it in some way, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, are, what do you find to be the hardest challenges with your writing or with writing in general? I think the hardest challenges in writing, it, it, it's funny, when you're outside of writing or when you're with people who don't know writers, you know, they're so impressed that you have published anything. <laughs> but then when you kind of get into what I loosely call the writing community, because as you know, it actually exists of a number of different communities, mm -hmm. both uh, regional and national, it seems like everybody's a writer, everybody's writing. Every year, uh, schools uh, graduate uh, a fresh new crop of MFAs and MAs who, who want to write. It seems, it seems to me sometimes that there's almost a glut of writing out there. But then there's a whole world of people who don't interact with that or who only interact with that, um, say, uh, if they are readers of genre fiction or if they are studying in school and they have to take, I I'm talking, I'm not talking about people who are English majors or people writing majors, I'm talking about people who might have to take a writing class or, or a literature class and then they, they learn about certain writers. But you know, it, it's just so hard. I mean, I mean, let's face it. I mean, how many writers really 
I'm not talking about the United States because there are countries that revere their writers more than our, than our, than our country does. How many writers really have, do you think really have achieved the level of fame of say uh, your average movie star or pop star? Can you think of any? Very few, maybe Very a handful. Few. Yeah, name, all right, all right, I'll name one, Stephen King. Mm -hmm. I think that Stephen King and all blessings to Stephen King because his work can be uh, gripping, particularly I think his work adapts very well to television and movies. But I think, yeah, I think if I said Stephen King to the person on the street, people would know Stephen King. They might not have read him, but they would know who he is. They might not have read him, but they may have seen a television show or a movie based mm -hmm. on one of his many, many books. You know, he's very prolific. Yeah. And really what's happened over the past dozen or so years is he's actually gotten some respect from the serious writing community for his work. But, you know, it's hard for me to think of anyone you know, who's at that Stephen King level, because mm -hmm. then you go to genre writers, like, for example, people who like to read romances would probably know Nora Roberts, you mm -hmm. know, she's incredibly successful, incredibly, but if you don't read that kind of stuff, you know, Nora Roberts is not going to ring any bells, say, with uh, people that, do that don't read that sort of, um, that sort of fiction. And as for poets, you know, I think dead poet society, because it seems to me that the poets who are known in this country widely, I mean, beyond the poetry community, are, are kind of old dead poets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except, I don't know, well, well, Mary Oliver cultivated an audience beyond the usual poetry community, but she has died. So now I guess there's Billy Collins, who people make fun of, but my feeling is I don't despise a popular audience. I would love to have a popular audience, and I'm not going to be snarky and say, rah, 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 that Billy Collins, because, <laughs> you know, writers can be very snarky and, and envious and jealous, as you know. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's the other thing is don't expect if you become a writer, you're going to find this universally loving community of people around you yes you're going to find good generous some good generous people but you're going to find some really difficult people too you have to and I'm not saying I don't believe that we grow a hide or we grow a skin or anything like that I'm not going to tell you that I'm saying that it's that one of the reasons I read tricycle the Buddhist magazine although I am not a Buddhist <laughs> is that some Buddhist techniques about how to breathe, how to sit with your emotions, how to detach yourself from certain painful things that are going on right now are useful to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not only as a person, but as a writer, because yeah, you do have to face a lot of rejection and a lot of snarkiness. And then even when you have books published, and you're not Stephen King, realizing that, oh, hooray, I had a book published, you know, mm -hmm. very few people really actually have read it, <laughs> or uh, although sometimes you're, you're, you know, you're, you're happily surprised, there are poems of mine that have been taught and that even have been written about critically, which is kind of a hoot to read something like that when... <laughs> when when your poem is being dissected by an academic in a book and 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 you're thinking hey I never thought of that <laughs> the way that because you know a, a poem's recreated or anything's recreated by the reader mm -hmm. and what the reader sees or gets isn't necessarily what the writer meant and so that can be kind of fun in a way it's sort of like so this is what this person got out of my poem that's interesting <laughs> now do you um when do you find time to write? And do you always like go through the same kind of routine when you're writing or do you? You know, my only rule is you must write something every single day. And by something, I, I even count these little extemporaneous birthday poems that I do for people on Facebook. 
uh, you know, I write them fairly quickly, but they're, you know, they're personal. I would like to think that they were a cut above Hallmark verse or doggerel. I call them catterel because I think they're cut above doggerel. But even doing something like that, mm -hmm. you know, is, is writing. Uh, looking at an old piece of work and revising it is writing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that even work I do for pay, uh, like I, I do academic editing, you know, papers, academic papers and uh, that sort of thing, even that, which is not, which some people would not think of as creative writing has this creative aspect. Anytime you're writing, you're writing. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's face it, the past year has been a very, very difficult year. There are some people who seem to have been inspired by it to write a zillion poems about COVID or a zillion stories about COVID. But there are those of us, and I'll be honest, I have found it a very dispiriting year for writing. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't been writing, but I found myself turning more and more to prose, both to book reviews, which I do on a somewhat regular basis and to fiction. I do have circulating now um, a fiction chat book. Now, Lord knows how many times I'm going to have to send it out before someone takes, um, takes an interest in it. Uh, some people think they're only poetry chat books, but there are chat books of fiction. This is this is happens to be five interconnected stories. Um, four of them have been published uh, in some form, although I revised them in putting them together in a mini book so that there would be more continuity among them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there is also a novel manuscript that I'm working on. I'm just I'm trying to get some feedback from a couple of writer friends on it because you know, I because I I the only writing group that I currently belong to is a fairly new one, and what we do in that group is extemporaneous writing. Someone gives a prompt, and then we spend like fifty minute writing, fifty minutes writing, and then we uh, share the work with the other people. This is all being done by Zoom on Zoom, of course, <laughs> <laughs> but and we only make. Uh, positive comments. And although there is the germ, uh, you know, in some of these pieces, there's the germ of a piece that you might want to work on further. You know, it is not the same as being in a group where people critique your writing. But again, I've had good experiences with groups like that. And I've had bad experiences, and it just seems harder to connect with people in the pandemic. So I'm going the Anne Lamott route and having two people whose opinions I trust look over this partial manuscript and let me know what they think and if I'm going in the right direction with it. Mm -hmm. So, and plus I, I also have a couple of, I have a stack of books awaiting my attention for reviews as well. Okay. So. But I somehow have not felt compelled to write poetry. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether poetry has dried up in me after all the poems I've written and you know I I still I, I have another poetry manuscript that I hadn't I haven't had any success in placing in addition to the, the poems I've published so uh, in books I mean I, I've published over a hundred poems they're not all collected in books mm -hmm. but uh, ever since the pandemic I've just really, um, although I did participate in a challenge. That's another thing you can do. You know, National Poetry Month is coming up. And I know a lot of people who are going to be writing a poem a day, mm -hmm. uh, just drafting something for National Poetry Month. And I was thinking maybe I'll try it this year just because my poetry muse seems to have like fled in the face of COVID and other illness. Because, you, you know, at any time... The, uh, there's some illness in my family and other things and it just seems that COVID has made everything worse like like the ordinary things we deal with mm -hmm. whether it's you know I know you have two sons and just the, not just everyday life but when something happens that isn't COVID mm -hmm. to in the family it just makes it so much worse <laughs> even though it's not COVID 
Right. So, so maybe, uh, maybe doing, maybe just, as I said, drafting a poem a day and uh, maybe even using some prompts and there's plenty of prompts. That's, that's the other thing I want to tell people. There's so many prompts and writing exercises that you can access for free on the internet, mm -hmm. even if you're working by yourself, that can be really helpful, you know? Mm -hmm. but you do have to get to, but you do have to get to know people and you do have to be persistent <laughs> yeah I've known you for quite a few years now and I've had the pleasure of publishing some of your work you've also won uh awards for four of your books you've had 70 plus publications and 18 anthologies published and well, you're writing... well, we're working in 18 different anthologies so okay. Um, your work, though, it, it's so great to read because you really take the reader into the work. You can picture being inside of it. And I love that about your writing. Um, really? I, oh, that, that's like one of the nicest things you could say to me, <laughs> that when you read my work, you feel that you're taken into it. Because even when I was a little girl, I would think to myself, maybe someday my book will be in the card catalog, the card catalogs that I, you know, for, I your, remember card for your younger listeners, <laughs> card catalog, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have computerized uh, search systems. It was actually like a big cabinet and you pulled out, it was alphabetical and you pulled it out and you looked for books mm -hmm. <laughs> or authors. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of always thought of writing as kind of like a message in a bottle almost mm -hmm. or a letter written to someone who might come across it years later. I, I felt like I was in communication when I would read with writers and some of those writers had been dead for years because when I was a little girl, you know, I read you know, classic children's fiction. And some of those writers were, you know, not on the, not no longer on the earth, but yet I felt like I was kind of in a communication with them because I was entering their worlds. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the best compliment as a writer from a reader is I felt like I really entered into the, your world. Yeah. I mean, I read, um, well, I've read everything that you've published on my site. Mm -hmm. But I've read a couple other pieces of yours preparing for this interview. And you even like the poetry, the short stories, everything, you just have a way of bringing the writers into your writing. And I just, it was gorgeous writing. Thank you. You know, I, one of the things that I've done, because I've done a lot of different things other than writing, obviously, mm -hmm. and it was on my bucket list, if I could use that word, that phrase. <laughs> is I taught someone to read through what was the Greater Pittsburgh Literacy Council, which is now called Literacy Pittsburgh. I taught a middle-aged man who, from, for a number of circumstances beyond his control, had not learned to read. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, it was just amazing. Their slogan used to be open up a life and it really did. But in describing to him my own pleasure in reading, and he did sort of go beyond even becoming functionally literate to taking an interest in certain books, I said, it's like word pictures form in your mind. Mm -hmm. And I realized that when I'm writing, it's like I am experiencing you know, it's almost like I'm in a movie and I'm experiencing what is happening and I'm describing it, you know, when I really get into it, mm -hmm. you know, as the words go on the page, I am imagining watching the characters, uh, being in the scene, you know, it doesn't, you know, that's like being in the groove. It doesn't happen all the time, but yeah, I do think that that I, I do feel, you know, it's, it's not just the laborious, oh, you know, putting down different words. Sometimes it is at, at a certain level, but I do often, and I think particularly with stories or with poems that have a narrative thread as a lot of my, my poems do, you know, it's like I'm there. Mm -hmm. And even though on another level, I'm consciously shaping an experience 
and you know fictionalizing an experience in another level i'm there you know i'm 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 it's, it's like playing out in my head like a movie because mm -hmm. you know y'all you know we're you know for generations now people have been familiar with movies and television and things like that it, you know yeah so if that gets conveyed to the reader that's like really exciting to me mm -hmm. yeah. because as a writer that's my favorite part of being a writer is when I am so into what I am writing that I'm right that I'm in the story it's like I'm out of my body and then <laughs> an hour or two can pass and then you're like huh and you know and you didn't even realize that time was passing that quickly mm -hmm. because you're so into what you're writing yeah um I get the same way sometimes I'm like all of a sudden I'm hungry and I look up at the clock and I'm like oh <laughs> Yeah, I didn't realize and, I was writing this long. And you hadn't realized because you were so immersed in the experience mm -hmm. of doing your writing. And I don't know if you have that same thing with the, the story kind of like you're in the story, you feel like you're in the story and you're seeing the images as you're, it's almost like you're transcribing what your imagination is, is, is seeing. Yeah. And yeah, hours can go by when you're doing something like that and you mm -hmm. don't even know it. <laughs> Where can somebody find your books or the pieces you've published? Well, I I will tell you this. Uh, there are, there are a couple ways, and I'm I'm actually gonna do we do we have a comment thing so that I so that I can send you a couple of different a couple yeah. of different websites. Yeah. Website. yeah, 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 yeah. Here here's here's the chat. But the first thing I'm going to say is. Since I have a slightly unusual name, if you just, you know, go on Google and put Angel Ellis in quotes, in quotation marks, you will come up with a lot of hits mm -hmm. on things that I have written. So, so that's one way to do it. The second way is if you are on Facebook, and let me, let me just get this for a second. I have a public Facebook page that is devoted to my writing. Let me just. Okay. Now I'm going to I'm going to put I'm going to put that up here. Let's see. Can I paste it? Okay, uh, the, the, the page is called Tell It Slant, Poetry Views and Reviews. And I, I will post things that I, that, I, that I write and that have been published or even republished on that page. And another thing I, I would recommend to people, if you want to do a public Facebook page and if you're willing to spend a little bit of money boosting some of your posts, to your, for example, I boost my posts to my friends and my friends' friends throughout the United States. And sometimes, you know, it takes off and it, more people become aware of your writing. And it, it isn't really all that much money. So uh, as I said, in addition to the regular Google search, you can, you can find my stuff there. Or uh, I also have a very extensive LinkedIn profile. Um, much more extensive than many people do. And it includes um, samples of my work as well as links to all four of my books, which all, all four of which still can be, uh, can be purchased. Let me, uh, let me put that up now. there that is that's my linkedin page but but as i said if you go on it, it you know it, it it not only gives all my experience but and including journals that i've published in but it uh, there are links to all four of my published books and there are pieces there that i featured that i've written including a video of one of my favorite poems i've written called Matches, that my brother who is a graphic designer did the um did the images for and put some uh, music to. It's on YouTube, so it's uh, you know I actually have a couple poems on YouTube, but but that one 
is one that I think is it's just perennially re relevant because it's about an incident that happened to my grandmother when she was a little girl first come to this country 11 years old uh, and I think with the struggles that we're having now over immigration and prejudice and lots of things it is still a very relevant poem even though this happened 100 years ago so so those are those are three places where people can 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 look can look at my stuff but the, but the other thing that i would that i recommend to people is you know there's been a resurgence as you know nicole in local bookstores mm -hmm. uh and local bookstores will even will be happy in many most cases to order books for you if you want to buy a book to order a book for you if they are you know in print and there's also of course used bookstores that sell a lot of books that aren't in print mm -hmm. but to buy from a uh, you know a local bookstore you know either one that carries you know new or in print books or one that carries used books for example uh just to name one white whale which is in bloomfield has a great selection of books including a big children's section the couple who own it have two little children and uh you know, if you want, you want, you know, I, I think it's also good. You, you've got to kind of enlist your buds, you know, uh, get five people to call a bookstore and ask for your book. And believe me, they will order it. <laughs> <laughs> and they will split the profits with you. But it's there's something, you know, to having a book sold at a local bookstore. You know, and I, and I'm not going to go on anti Amazon rant because, to be frank, without Amazon and its services, a lot of us wouldn't have places to showcase our books online. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, let's not forget the resurgence of the local bookstore. I agree. And the local bookseller. <laughs> so, uh, but. You know, it's funny. I, you know, I like to think of cycles, you know, in in for in a writer's life rather than, you know, you know, I think we, you know, the Western way is to think of life as a ladder, mm -hmm. and we 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 go up and go up and go up on the ladder, and then we hope that we freeze at a certain point, and then we just die there in our beds when we're like ninety five years old. Well, to me, life is more like the Eastern wheel. That's why I said it's funny to me almost that there I was in college all those years ago and among the things I did was write reviews of uh, books and films and write essays and that that's something I've been doing in recent years like <laughs> oh well that came full circle and now again feeling at the moment that I'm more drawn to prose, including fiction than poetry. And, that, and well, that's, you know, again, that's something that's, uh, that, that I'm, you know, that's sort of a bit, both a bit newer for me, but that's something also that I'm returning to. I thank you for joining me today and talking about your work. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me, Nicole, and thank you for the wonderful compliment of saying that if people look at my work, check out my work, they may feel that they are there and, you know, they, they, they may feel that there, there is that connection for them. I really appreciate you saying that and I really appreciate chatting with you today. I mean, I only see people this way now. <laughs> Eventually, so we'll nice see each other in person again. Yes, it's so nice to see your, your face. And thank you again for the Holiday Cafe, uh, your blog spot magazine, and for everything that you do uh, to, to promote local writing, and also for the children's books that you're writing, because I don't think we ever have enough good children's books. That is one category I didn't mention that I think is, I, I tell you, if I could write a good children's book, I think I would die happy because I think it's a very hard, people think, oh, that's easy. No, it's the hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest thing to do. 
and the books that become beloved in kids' lives. I mean, I, I think even if they don't go on to be big readers in, as an adult, that's like a tremendous thing to do for them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. All right.